the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 161. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. We've got another great individual to jump into today on show 161, don't we? He is the original man of purpose, isn't he? Yep, he really is. Today, listeners, we are going back into the archives of the Moonshot Show and digging out Yvonne Chenard, co-founder and creator and CEO of Patagonia, one of the most well-known clothing brands, I'd say, in the world, Mike. I would agree. And it is dripping with people and passion. And there is so much to learn from Yvonne Chouinard, the founder, from Patagonia, but we're also delighted to say that he wrote a book which captures a lot of his values and ideas about how we can lead purpose-led companies. And you know, Mark, the reason this is so timely and important is that Yvonne Chouinard, just, he doesn't just talk the talk. He walks the walk. He really empowers his people and he puts his purpose before profit. And so many people just do the talking, but don't do the walking. But in Yvonne Chouinard, we have the real deal, don't we, Mark? Yeah. I mean, we'd say that he walks the walk, but I mean, he also surfs, he kayaks, he falcons, <laughs> he fly fishes, he climbs. You know, I think he he's, climbs. he's, yeah, he's climbing the climb and walking the walk. But you're right. I think it's very, it's still pretty rare to have an individual who chooses the people and the vision of the company over the profitability, as well as the commercialism of having a big, particularly in fashion, particularly in clothing. <laughs> Which as an industry, Mark, it's so, it's so fascinating. He's in an industry that if you think about the impact, particularly of fast fashion, um, the, uh, the conditions that people uh, who manufacture the clothes, uh, the conditions they work in, and look at the mm. effects there. Think about the runoff from dyes and pollutants that are directly related to, to fashion. As you just process it, that's what makes his success as a purpose-led climate and environmentally focused brand like Patagonia, who are focused on sustainability. He's doing this in one of the most mischievous industries that there really is, right? Yeah. And he's preserved that ambition, that focus, that vision throughout the, the entire history of the company, hasn't it? I mean, it's still one of the ones, one of the brands that when you're starting out in marketing or advertising, or you're looking at famous, well-known brands with a, with a co-founder or with a founder who's driving for something specific, mm. Patagonia invariably comes up as a great case study. And I think it's really down to Yvonne Chenard and his, his vision of driving the company from a people perspective, as well as a product one. Yeah. And I love the payoff to the book, um, the education of a reluctant businessman. Uh, <laughs> it's just so perfect. He's kind of a quirky guy. He's fun. He's a bit of a character. He's got a lot uh, to teach us. In fact, he is such a, such a great teacher, Yvonne Chenard with so much just dripping in wisdom and lessons that he's really done that uh, when we recorded this show, we invited the brand guru and author Patrick Hamlin to join us on the show to help us deconstruct and really just in, enjoy and savor all the things there are to learn around people and purpose with Yvonne Chenard. So let's kick it off and let's get to, to meet our guest on the show, Mr. Patrick Hamlin. Well, Patrick is somebody that I've known for many, many years. He is a prolific author. Um, his signature piece, uh, one might say, is uh, the book Primal Branding. Please check your Amazon stores for the book. And he has produced numerous uh, iconic uh, advertising campaigns. He's worked with brands like Levi's and Pepsi and well, you name it, he's worked with them and he's all about how you create this spirit of community that is story and narrative driven and how to have posi positive impact on the world. It's my pleasure, Patrick, to welcome you on the show. Hello. 
Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. You're so very welcome. And when we when we chose to have you on the show, we have to give our listeners a bit of an inside tip. It was because we have one of probably the greatest living brands by one of the greatest entrepreneurs. So we are very pumped to unleash your thinking onto uh, what has to be one of the greatest brands. But I think, Chad, we should stop the suspense. Who are we going to dive into this show? Yvonne Chouinard of Patagonia. And he is pretty amazing. And then I, I, I must say, when I did the research for the show, he, he went from pretty amazing to right up there. I mean, I, I gathered these clips and, and research and found myself wanting to work for Patagonia. Chad, what do you think? I mean, what makes Patagonia and, and the work from Yvonne Chouinard so special? Well, I don't want to give everything away before we uh, get to the clips here, but I'll just say I'm I'm always thrilled and excited to kind of veer off the technology innovation path and and find someone like Yvonne at a at a company like like Patagonia. But um, Patrick, I'm I'm curious from you, what has been most surprising or interesting to you about Patagonia in the last few years, or even just as maybe you've watched it over the past forty years. Well, I just wanted to say first that I've listened to a lot of these shows, not all of them, grant you, but this is, I'm so glad that you brought me into this one because I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a Patagonia fan. I might even be part of the tribe. I don't climb, don't um, necessarily camp that much anymore, but I sure fall into the aesthetic and the, um, and the belief system, definitely. So what, out, what I thought was outstanding, I hadn't read the book. Let My People Go Surfing, which is a primer for anyone who wants to look at any purpose-driven brand. Hmm. And it, what fell out of that for me, I think, was how totally, when we talk about being authentic, we talk about being organic, we talk about all of these being genuine and all of these things. And here was a guy who didn't really want to become a businessman or entrepreneur. It just kind of fell into his lap. He was just making better things. He was forging his hmm. own chucks and pythons and and realized that in the course of climbing these mountains they were also destroying them by going up the same routes over and over again and so rather than hammering these things into the side of the mountain they invented new ways in clean climbing what they called and and it's kind of that's kind of been the the model ever since yeah it's perhaps one of the biggest things he has to offer uh, in terms of learning is, you said it, he's authentic. This guy built products in a way he thought was best for him, for the customer, for the employee. And I think our listeners are going to find he is very folksy, street shooting kind of a guy. He doesn't have all that elaborateness you might find from a Silicon Valley exec, but you're so right. I mean, this guy, he is, Chad, this guy's the real deal. Yeah, I mean, he went from dirtbag to founding and running a billion dollar company with over 2,500 employees. Mm. Um, and we've got a great uh, introduction uh, from a Patagonia employee, just to give you the listeners a sense of, of you know, how far the company's come and, and what they're doing today. So here's a, here's a primer on Patagonia from one of their own. Patagonia is based in Ventura, California, mainly because there's a great surf break there. It is uh, right now a little less than a billion dollars, about 2,500 employees uh, across the world. Patagonia was founded 40 years ago by a French-Canadian climber, Yvonne Chouinard. From the beginning, Yvonne set out to create an uncompany. So we want to create a place where people could make money and do the things they wanted to do and live full lives. We hire people at Patagonia, whether it's a corporate office or in our retail stores, who are interested in and love the spaces that they live. We look for a passion for caring about the environment. And if we're doing things that force the store manager to be in the back room all the time, or our employees, you know, to only be on the floor behind the cash wrap, then we're doing something that is antithetic to the culture and the purpose and why we're here in the first place. Culture matters, and you know when it matters most, when you stick to it in the great times and the really challenging times. 
And so when I look at the history of Patagonia, obviously right now are very good times. But the decisions that we make, even in the bad times, because there were bad times with Patagonia. 2008 was kind of not a great time for Patagonia and a lot of companies, but we didn't cut healthcare. We didn't cut on-site childcare. We didn't cut training and development. That's the test of true culture is when the decisions you make are consistent, whether a business is really, really good or really, really challenging. And I think that's why our employees stick with us at just ridiculously low rates of turnover. An element of the Patagonia culture is this irreverent, unconventional approach. So if, if everyone is just turning right, Patagonia is definitely the company that will turn left from an unconventional approach to the democratization of work. Hmm. It's like everyone's turning right and uh, uh, they'll take left. What what you heard there was, for me, a very uh, timely reminder on having purpose is the start of making life very clear as a business person because you just ask yourself, does this action or does what is the decision to make that best reflects our purpose? And we can hear how contrarian they are. They didn't cut all of those extra value add services, which uh, is how some companies would look at them. They maintained them during tough times. And to me, this is a very powerful lesson in going out into the world to try and achieve a greater good and to have positive impact. And you can see that their success, which is so important to recognize, they're in the world of fast fashion where, you know, uh, the likes of H&M and Zara pride themselves on turning product into store in less than two weeks. These guys are taking their time to build timeless products. And we're going to hear so much in the show about how they were, how they created the company, how they came up with these incredibly powerful set of ideas that, that fuel uh, the culture of the company. And we're going to hear about some of their philosophies and approaches and, and how they just think about people uh, as a whole. And it's, it's very important stuff. And it's very good that we're doing this because we've not had someone so strong on culture and doing well by doing good. I I think this is a big fuel injection for the cultural barometer within organizations, Chad. I think this one, this one's going to be unique indeed. Yeah, I'm excited. And don't forget, we're going to ask Patrick all about Let My People Go Surfing, the uh, book that Yvonne wrote uh, a while ago. Patrick, I'm, I'm curious, as uh, as we get into the show, what are some things that you're kind of looking to learn from Yvonne as we unpack some of these clips? Well, I think that Mike just steered us toward one, which is the whole reference to H&M and the instant fashion thing, fast fashion, and how Patagonia is not their clothing company, but they're not really a fashion company. As a matter of fact, in their mission and values, the concern over transitory fashion trends is specifically not a corporate value. So they're not going from the, they're not going to be at fashion week. (laughs) It's so true. You'll never find them there because they'll probably be a bit too busy catching waves um, out the front of their office. So Exactly. So having values, but then is one thing, but sticking to them through Mm -hmm. the dark times is another thing. Yeah. And we see in the up and down of corporate culture, startup life, we've all been presented with situations where you're just doing a double take and going, what? And when someone does something that's so contrarian to the values they might espouse, this is where, you know, I think the cast is is died about good companies, maybe companies that are going to fail. And it's definitely the the moment of truth to decide great companies. Now, we've heard so much about how contrarian they are, how, how they've got this incredible courage to do things. And a lot of this stems from Yvonne Chouinard, the founder. And he has this contrarian, fearless, courageous style about him, this essence. It's, it's more than style. He has this essence. And this first clip we're going to play to you is part of a whole series we've got about how the company came about and the sort of mentality and approach it took from him. So let's now have a listen to his thoughts on what the essence of being an entrepreneur is and how it might be not what you expect. So here's Yvonne Chouinard. 
You know, one of my favorite quotes about entrepreneurs is if, if you want to understand the entrepreneur, study the juvenile delinquent. Because, you know, they're saying, you know, this sucks. <laughs> and I'm going to do it my own way. I love that clip because it, it goes back to his heritage as a climber. He was a self-professed dirtbag of the 60s and, and 70s. And it's just fascinating to me how he stumbled into what would become Patagonia. Mm. So as before, he's, he, he's kind of he's saying, you know, we're like juvenile delinquents mm. saying, oh, this sucks. <laughs> so we're just going to do it our own way. And I, I've never heard, you know, entrepreneur described in that way. But uh, I, I love, I love that that metaphor. Yeah, he he's got that thing. He's he's almost a bit Branson esque, you know, a bit contrarian, uh, counterculture, bringing that into the entrepreneurial world. Pat, I'm interested to know from you when you think about this sort of contrarian approach. Do you see this a lot in successful founders and leaders within organizations? Is this a characteristic that when, you, when you're writing about creating a movement, do you think uh, this plays a role in, in how he's a, a, amassed such a huge community of brand lovers? Well, I think that in this case, the yes, the quick answer is yes. And in um, the beginning, the people that had worked at Patagonia, they only worked there long enough to, uh, according to Yvonne anyway, they worked there long enough to uh, make enough money to go off on another trip to Chile and go surfing <laughs> or go mountain, mountain climbing in the Alps. Mm. Uh, and then they'd come back and drift back. Mm. And so it was very hard to keep people <laughs> um, dedicated, committed, I guess. Committed is probably the right word, right? And so when you have a band of renegades like that, a, it's kind of hard to run a business. But B, yes, I think everything kind of flowed out of that. Yeah. And of course, you have all the, you know, Apple started in a garage. Hawaiian Tropics started in a in a garage also mm. with uh, Ron Rice uh, stirring the goop, you know, with a mm. shovel. So, mm. yeah. So it, it not everyone went out for investor funding, funding, seed funding, and everything. And um, Patagonia actually had a problem getting loans. Yeah, the the interesting juxtaposition, or or what might not be a natural bedfellow to this renegade. I love that Pat. This renegade characteristic is that they're actually product obsessed. So just because they're free spirited doesn't mean that they don't have the discipline to knuckle down and design great products. And we all know that uh, solving a problem is at the essence of entrepreneurship and your product has to be obsessed with solving problems of your customers. So what's very nice is they might be renegades, they might be contrarians, but they have enormous aptitude to delve into the problem that their customers have. The great news there, they happen to be their own customers because they're all outdoors people, which I think is another pattern that we can decode in their success. But now let's have a listen to, to Yvonne talking about how we can get into problem solving and how, where the products really come from. So let's have a listen to this. Well, I, I never wanted to be a businessman. I, I was a craftsman and I was a climber. And I just, every time I'd go into the mountains, I'd have ideas on how to make the gear better. The gear was pretty crude in those days. It was all made in Europe. And uh, so I... I just got myself a forge and an anvil and a book on blacksmithing and I taught myself how to blacksmith and and that led to making these pitons and and um, and eventually ice axes and and uh, crampons and all the gear for mountain climbing and uh, and never did it thinking that it was a business it was a uh, at first, it was just making the stuff for myself and friends, and then friends of friends, and pretty soon I'm making two of these pitons an hour and selling them for a dollar and a half each. Well, <laughs> not too not too profitable, right? <laughs> yeah, I I love how he his life was dependent upon the product that he was making. So if he wasn't already obsessed enough with it, here he's creating. And in 
innovating on and iterating on this product that he's using to hang from El Capitan and, and other mountains that, that he's climbing. And it was really out of necessity for him. And he kind of jokes at the end, you know, that he was <laughs> selling them for, for not much money. And it just, you know, it started out of, you know, he had his own anvil and forge. Um, and taught himself. I mean, yeah, Chad, exactly. he just gets in there and says, oh, I just taught myself to be a blacksmith. I mean, sounds easy to say, but like, I wouldn't even know where to start. And just the idea you're dealing with all that fire and iron. And um, I mean, this is a world away for me. Maybe my digital world is just not analog enough, but, but that just seems like, wow. And he seems so matter of fact about it, doesn't he? Yeah. And I, I'm curious, Patrick, like if you know, I mean, you mentioned Hawaii Tropic. I'm curious if you know of any other kind of founding stories that, that kind of started this messily, you know, if, if you will. Sure. Almost all of them. Uh, Henry Ford making the, his, his automobiles. Yeah, the, the Ford story is, is epic. But, but Chad, I will take you back to one of our shows. When Virgin Airlines started, it was on the back of a smeared chalkboard with Richard Branson saying, I need to get to this island. I'll charter a plane, 25 bucks a, a, a flight from island to island. I mean, solving a problem, taking the initiative, not being, you know, in your head and scared of failure. They just jump right in and they learn it. They, they pick up the tools and go for it, don't they? Yeah. And he, he didn't stop. You know, he started with these, these climbing pitons, but soon branched out into essentially everything that he used as a climber and as an outdoors person, mm. you know, all the way to pants and shorts this really cool kind of fuzzy wool like fabric that, but it was synthetic so that when you got it wet, you know, it would dry quickly instead of, you know, wearing wool and it staying wet for weeks on end, mm. uh, you know, essentially just creating the products out of necessity as opposed to looking and seeing what's popular on trend and doing that. Oh yeah, totally. And, and it's so great. Um, you know, he, he just, took the initiative, started making things for himself. And before he knew it, he's a product designer. And what's great about the next clip, fast forward a few years and he wakes up and has this realization, oh my gosh, I'm a businessman, which was certainly something that he'd never set out to do. In fact, you know, he talks often about business people, you know, no one grows up wanting to be a businessman because, you know, they're basically all versions of, of Gordon Gecko. So, this next clip is fantastic because this is what his reflections upon him uh, as a, as a businessman. But I but I want to give Pat this opportunity to reflect on just the relationship uh, that you know building products and then before you know it turning into a businessman. When you when you hear him talking about creating these products and and you know the journey he's on, what comes to your mind, Pat? Well he really glances over something that's really important. And I think he talks about, he, he just made a slight mention of the products weren't very good back then. The pr products really sucked back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there wasn't the clothing and so forth. What he talks about, what, one of the things they talk about in the book, and maybe I'm giving the book, book review away, but <laughs> as we go, but the, they talk about uh, cutting off a pair of chinos and wearing a white shirt, button down shirt that would, they would pick up out of uh you know, it's from the Salvation Army or someplace. So they get it cheap and didn't care if they roughed it up. But that's the kind of stuff, whereas uh, they've always tried to build quality products. And uh, in order to make corduroy, he spotted some corduroy over in Scotland or someplace. The factory had closed and they had to call seven retired gentlemen <laughs> away from the pub to start the machine up again. And the, the, these old craftsmen, warned him, you know, once the blades on this machine go dull, we'll never be able to use it again because we don't have the wherewithal to, to sharpen the blades anymore. And it, luckily the machine lasted seven more years, but wow. that kind of dedication and just, um, sort of brilliant nonchalance toward who cares, we'll just make it in any way as long as yeah. we can. Right. And essentially waiting for the customers to like beat down his door to make the thing. Yeah, it's quality, quality first and customers came later. Whereas today, of course, we always want to ask the customer and get user studies. And Yeah, but he, another story, like, he, you know, he, he found this great rugby shirt, which if you've 
ever played rugby and worn a jersey. And it's this really nice, thick material and it's got a good collar and all of that was perfect for the climbers so that they didn't get rope burns and, you know, their shirts weren't torn to shreds. That replaced and, the white button down. Yeah. Yeah. But he, I think he had to, you know, all of his friends and, and family were saying like, we, we need these. And so he had to hunt down, you know, the manufacturer of these shirts to, to go and do it. So like he never, he never set out to like create this great outdoors and, and apparel company. And this, this clip that Mike was alluding to is I think a perfect summation of that. And I couldn't help but laughing when we heard it. So here's just, here's Yvonne kind of owning up to his, uh, f- you know, fateful realization that oops, uh, he's a businessman now. I, I kind of backdoored becoming a businessman because this is, this is in the sixties and you know, businessmen were all grease balls in the sixties. <laughs> You know, this is a counterculture that we were in, and we didn't respect business. In fact, they were the they were the enemy. And so, uh, uh, you know, one day uh, later on, I kind of woke up and discovered, oh my God, I am a businessman. And that's when I decided I better find out what I'm doing, and. Um, Started reading a lot of books on, on business and, and basically trying to f- create a business that we wanted to come to work in. All of us, I mean, it wasn't just me, but all of us were all dirtbags. Yeah, what a, what a powerful clip because it, the essence of that is when he had the, the realization, he didn't just dwell in it. He put himself to work and started reading books and studying what it meant to be a businessman. And this is exactly what he does with everything. You'll remember that when he talked about building a product, he just went out and learned how to be a blacksmith. He went and read books. This is constantly what he does. And this is by far the most powerful theme of all the successful innovators and entrepreneurs is their lifelong learners. And what's important here is it all comes off the back his entrepreneurship comes off the back about what we heard was this to him, which seems quite natural, is this obsession with great product, this obsession with solving problems. And I think this is one of the biggest lessons we can take from him. It doesn't matter whether you're high tech, low tech, whether you're digital or analog, it really matters that you go out in the world and you solve problems and that we are learning constantly that entrepreneurship is a means for entrepreneurs to achieve their mission. So the mission is not to be an entrepreneur itself. The mission is to see positive impact in the world. And we've seen that time and time again, haven't we, Chad? Yeah. And I think where we've seen it go wrong is where the the entrepreneur is in it for the wrong reason. Mm. And I don't want to name names, but I'm sure we can all think of 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 either someone in our own experience or out there kind of in, in the news and the media that kind of got that equation backwards. And, and Yvonne just embodies that mission and purpose first, mm. product first mm. philosophy so well. Yeah. Pat, I wanted to ask you about this idea of learning. Um, you're an author, you've written uh, several books, you write for some very prestigious uh, magazines and so forth. What's your practice of learning? How do you keep yourself abreast and how do you keep growing and and where does that start for you? Oh, that's such a hard question to answer with all the splintered channels and everything that we have. The, mm-hmm. um, I have several feeds that I go to every day mm-hmm. and then I read constantly. I read more than I listen. Um, one of my daughter's, is constantly on I, iTunes and so forth, list, reading, uh, listening to books rather than reading them. I think there's something to reading things still. So yeah. I still have some analog in me. Good on but you. The, Good on you. Yeah, reading reading is, is a beautiful thing. And surely the, the practice of writing, uh, the fact that you know you have to uh, bring an idea and put pen to paper, that must be a big part of your learning because ideas just get better when you write, don't they? I think so. Yeah. 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 I feel that way. Yeah. For me, it's, it's the pressure to write and to get your idea as clear as possible. Uh, Invariably it makes my, what's in my mind even sharper once I'm committing it to paper. It's, it's almost, I don't know, there's, there's some, 
you know, growth of my membranes, you know, when I'm writing it, just it clarifies, solidifies the idea, doesn't it? You know, I didn't realize this until I was pretty old, but the um, seeing something, I'm a visual person, so I need to see something on paper, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so now we've got this, this lens that we're looking at Yvonne Chouinard, founder of Patagonia through, we know that he's very contrarian. He's a renegade, as Patrick said, we know that uh, it all started with making better climbing products for himself. And before he knew it, he was a businessman, but everything goes next level. There was a point in time where it was do or die for Patagonia. It was do or die for the entire company. And this was a classic tipping point in their history. And it was either going to go good or it was going to go very bad for them. And what we have here is him reflecting on this moment. And I just want to give a heads up to all the listeners. Make sure you tune into this following clip because there is so much inside of this because not only is it about learning and coming together, but it is about resilience and about turning adversity into opportunity. So let's have a listen to Yvonne Chouinard, founder of Patagonia, on where the true origin, the essence of the Patagonia brand, where it came from, when and how. Well, uh, I, you know, I've been on a lot of different expeditions and trips, but uh, the longer they are, the more you, you get something out of them. And uh, this was a six month trip. And so we left Ventura, California with an old van. This was Doug Tompkins and myself and, and uh, some other folks. And we loaded the van up with surfboards and skis and climbing equipment, bought an old um, Bolex 16 millimeter camera and took off surfing all the way down to Lima went to Chile and climbed volcanoes and skied down them. That's where I learned to ski. <laughs> um, crossed over the Andes and went over to, and climbed uh, Fitzroy, a real famous mountain that had been only climbed twice. And we did a new route on it. And we made a film on the whole thing. And, and that's when I fell in love with that country, the, the southern end of South America called Patagonia. And uh, it's, it affected Doug Tompkins a lot and myself. And, uh, and that's why I named the, the, my clothing company Patagonia because it, I wanted to make clothing for those kind of conditions, you know, like Cape Horn and wild mountains and wild weather. And, and I've, uh, yeah, so I, that, that was a big effect. That was 1968. And it was, it was a wild trip. I mean, you know, you wake up sometimes sleeping on the ground in Guatemala with guns at your head. <laughs> Had a lot of adventures. He makes it sound so simple. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, it's kind of hard for me to believe that that yeah, that what we now know as Patagonia, you know, was just kind of discovered on a surf trip in a van down the down the western coast of uh, North and South America. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of intensity there, but there's also a lot of humility, isn't there? Mm. Actually, yeah, that's a good good thought about Yvonne Chouinard. He has uh, he reminds me a bit of um, Fred Smith from FedEx. You know, he's thoughtful, he's pragmatic, but at never at any sense do you feel ego when they talk. You'll notice he's often thinking about, you know, he's always quick to credit others. He's quick to attribute things to others. And it, it almost, the, the, the thing you have to be careful with, with Yvonne is like it all feels so easy uh, because I think he asks big questions and he's looking for the essence of things. And I think we have to remind ourselves it doesn't come as easy to all of us as it seems to to Yvonne. But I, I think that... But he's keeping it simple. Yeah. I, I think it's coming across as very easy because he has kept it so simple. And 
you know, after we, uh, after we talk about the book, Let My People Go Surfing, well, I think we'll get into the purpose and the dual mission that Yvonne created for the company that he's stuck with for 40 years. And I think that's why he's kind of, there's this easy confidence that comes through. I think that's where it really comes from is the simplicity of what he's chosen to do. Yeah. Without a doubt in this, this modern uh, world of notifications with artificial intelligence and machine learning, it is essential to keep it simple. And I, and I love how contrarian he is in that. And I think that we've already had such a gift in understanding the purpose of the renegade within him that has, that has created a billion dollar brand. It's created a venture company. It's created a food company that has all geared to, to not only leaving the world as it was, but to actually to leave it better than how he found it. And already that is such a noble and powerful cause but it's helped him also build a great brand. And part of what he's been trying to do in sharing his story is to inspire others to go do it as well. He's really, he only makes himself so accessible in order to provide some sort of roadmap for others. And I think at the very pinnacle of that roadmap, was his book. So um, he, he, uh, he penned together this, this book, Let My People Go Surfing. And without a doubt, it's, it's, a, it's such a well-reviewed and admired book. Its subtitle is The Education of a Reluctant Businessman. But I know that we will have anything but a reluctant uh, a set of thoughts from Patrick on the book. Patrick, you read the book, uh, you've heard some of the stories and, and, and the values that he's brought to life in the book. Listening uh, to him and, and reading this book, how would you position this book, you know, for anyone who wants to go and learn how to be an entrepreneur, an innovator, to go out in the world, what's, what's in the book for them? Well, I think it's a perfect example, as I said earlier, I think of being purpose-driven. and uh, But also it's very astute in terms of persistence and being um, very serious, really. And, uh, but even if it got serious, you know, work had to be enjoyable on a daily basis. There's a phrase in there that, that he gets to that says, uh, we all had to come to work on the balls of our feet and go up the stairs two steps at a time. I mean, that's not only persistence, but that's really a, the aggressive pursuit of something. <laughs> and, and right. And then there's another thing in the book that he mentions that he wanted to keep the company in Yarek. Y A R A K A K is the way it's spelled. A falconry term meaning that when your when your falcon is super alert, hungry but not weak, and ready to hunt. Hmm. So that's very intentional. How do you spell that 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 word? That's such an interesting idea. Yeah. Y-A-R-A-K. Yarek. Yarek. Okay. Very keep the, cool. Keep the company in Yarek, which seems wow. to be sort of a, that's, I don't know if that's a Zen state, but a purposeful yeah. intent state of high alert, state of high alert. Mm. Right. Mm. One, of, one of the things that strikes me, Chad, about him is the enormous scope of his achievement, but the simplicity and calm in which he seems to do it. What strikes you about uh, Yvonne Chouinard's disposition and approach that you think you could try and adopt when you're going out making great films and telling great stories about innovators? Like, what are you learning from from his almost his style of entrepreneurship? He's uh, he's like not tolerant of any assholes. Pardon my French. Mm. Uh, working at the company, you know, I this the phrase "let my people go surfing." It, I think it's an amazing book title and it says a whole lot about his philosophy just in that, that phrase, you know, it, if you weren't hitting the waves with him on the off days or after work, like he's not, you're not someone that he would want there with him. And it goes back to what you're saying, Pactor is like, they're, they're either surfing or working, you know, there's, there's kind of like, but they're totally impassioned and mm. And in in the state of flow in both of those things, and I think seeking out and encouraging those people to you know to come and work with him is is a big part of his success. Well, think about both of those things. They're both highly active. Uh, you have to be totally on, right? Mm. You can't be off when you're shooting through the wave, and you have to be mind very mindful and present. Yeah, and intentional. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to seize the opportunities. You, you can't just 
paddle yeah. out there aimlessly. You have to be able to see see the waves as they're coming in and know when to drop in and catch the wave. Take, take a risk, huh? Yep. yep. Yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a beautiful metaphor and we were you were saying Mike before we hopped on the show like <laughs> listening to all these clips you just want to work oh, for Yvonne Chenard and and work for the people at Patagonia and I think that is a really powerful aura and mythos mm-hmm. that he has has created I would I would say what you what, what you guys were talking about is play hard work hard yeah exactly you know with purpose with yeah. purpose yeah yeah. And, and that's, that's so, so we're so fortunate because what we've got coming up in the show is a whole bunch of insights around this purpose. And I think there's a lot to learn for us and for our listeners on how we can create purpose, not only for ourselves, for our teams, our organizations, the communities in which we live. Plus, just because Yvonne Chenard from P- Patagonia is full of of lessons. Um, we've got uh, a number of insights around people and, and philosophy. Uh, it's it's action packed. And now, if you're listening to this and you're like, what was that crazy word they used for keeping hungry? That and all the clips and links and references you'll find at moonshots.io, where you'll get all the goodies, past shows, show notes, you name it. It's all there on moonshots.io. Whew. So we're through. Uh, we're through the origin of Patagonia, uh, Chad. Where should we start with purpose? What's next? So I think we'll pick up right on the mission, and this is something from the research that we did. It's, it seems like Yvonne knew this from the very beginning, but this simple dual mission um, that he set, I think, was really what set them up for success. So here's Yvonne talking about Patagonia's dual mission. Original mission statement was make the best quality product. And we always felt that uh, something is perfected, not when you can't add anything more to it, but when you can't take anything away. You know, it's kind of a difference between an old fashioned Cadillac that was so butt ugly that they had to put all kinds of chrome breasts on it and stuff in on it. Compared to a Ferrari in those days, it didn't have any chrome on it. I mean, it's just as beautiful lines. And uh, so that's always been our philosophy. But then, you know, I thought we needed another part to our mission statement because really getting concerned about the natural world. And I was very concerned about never having a company that was unsustainable again. So we added in uh, the second part, which says cause no unnecessary harm. It doesn't say cause no harm because, you know, there's no way you can ever manufacture a product without causing harm. And according to the, you know, second law of thermodynamics, entropy, you basically end up with probably more waste than, than you end up in the, within the final product. <clears throat> there's, you know, there's no such thing as sustainability. There's a beginning and end to everything, as any Buddhist will tell you. Hmm. Less is more. He would be, imagine having him in the room with one of our other. Oh, Dieter. He and Dieter would get along so well. Yeah. How Dieter would strip everything away until there was nothing left to remove. It's really like being a sculptor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or working with clay, just breaking it down to its, to its essence. I love that. And I think in this, I mean, if there was one thing in working with large organizations, trying to create breakthrough products, the th- one of the things I see so much is what we commonly call the scope creep, which is putting more and more things into a product and, and the false sense of satisfaction that gives product designers like, oh yeah, we've got a button for this and a button for that. What if you, if you actually look at the things we love the Kindle, the iPhone, so much of what those products do is simplicity and the removal of distraction. And I think that apart from having this this mission of building great products and doing little harm, the essence is, you know, if you wanted a product strategy from Patagonia, it's less is more. I also think tying this greater purpose to the mission was a very... And doing that explicitly was a very good move on his Mm. part because I think it just creates this, 
Mike, you and I love talking about flywheels. I think that was one thing that he did to get this flywheel of amazing people into the company. Mm. And, you know, that, that was recently formalized, I think in 2010, 2011, you know, Patagonia became one of the first very large certified B corporations, you know, um, where, you know, it's in their little bylaws, you know, that it doing good and doing well is, is kind of married. Mm. You know, it's not just doing well financially. Mm. Um, all of those things combine to really get this, this flywheel spinning. So while it's rooted in great products, it's great products that in the process of being made do as little harm as possible. And I don't see how anyone can, you know, say no. Uh, to that kind of proposition and working at that kind of yeah. company. And what's so powerful is we actually see this uh, great product, Do Little Harm, coming coming actually to life in this next clip because they talk about how they've created products that embody both of these things. So let's have a listen to the journey that the the company went on and how it thought about bringing polyester to the world. One, one thing that's just happened very recently that uh, is really exciting, it's the most exciting thing that's happened in the company in a long time. We've partnered with a, with a uh, Japanese mill that just spent $100 million in a recycling plant where they're going to recycle polyester. Now, we've been making 40 different products out of, you know, all our fleece and stuff made out of recycled soda pop bottles. But... When you're done with those products and they're all worn out, you throw them away. But now we're telling our customers that when you're done with your capelline underwear, which is polyester, you bring it back to us and wash it first, <laughs> especially the thongs. <laughs> um, and then we're, we're going to bundle that stuff up and we're going to send it back to Japan. And, and it's going to go to this plant and they're going to melt this stuff down and take it to its original polymer and then make fiber and then we're going to make more underwear out of it. So we're going to complete the circle, what Bill McDonough calls cradle to cradle. And it's never been done with clothing. Yeah, going from recycled material to article of clothing back to raw material and then back to article of clothing is this just amazing cradle to cradle, as he said, cycle mm -hmm. that is the exact opposite of what you were saying. You know, you, the unique clothes and the Zara and the Zara's and the H and M's of yeah. the world. Yeah. And what's so exciting is that you can have a profitable business, you can do well by doing good because often there's this perception that doing the right thing in the end costs you a lot more. It's not the profitable way. You have to be kind of greedy to maximize profits. But the truth is many times it's been found that Patagonia outperforms the garment industry and the sports equipment industry for profitability, yet they actually have a positive impact on the world because they're doing, for example, cradle to cradle polyester. Um, I, I think this is this great uh, intersection of they have this vision, these values, but the things they do, the things they make actually reflect those. And I think this is the essence of not only Yvonne's uh, authentic, authentic nature as an entrepreneur. But Patrick, I think this is the key to why so many people love their brand because they truly do walk the talk. They practice what they preach, right? Right. And along with that brilliant quality, they have figured out this whole ecological bent to it. And they've been doing that since, you know, the beginning, really. They kind of fell into it. In the book, they talk about uh, saving one of the uh, salmon streams or rivers in um, right outside their, their doors, really, 500 feet away from their office in Ventura, mm. California. They were going to, the, the local council was going to build some, mess up the river still more. And their, their reason for doing that was because the river was already dead. And so someone uh, had a study, had done a study, some graduate student, who's now, I believe, at Pet, at, still at Patagonia. They hired him and brought him in to do more studies and do studies in other places. And from that, they, like I say, they just kind of fell into some of these things anyway. 
Mm. It, it, it seemed like the right thing to do. It seemed like the yeah. right thing to do. And they seem um, flappable, like it's just the right thing to do. It almost has this matter of fact feel about it that they just do what they, you, you know, they say they'll do. They practice what they breach. And I'm trying to think, Chad, of all the shows we've done, has it, has has there ever been an entrepreneur that we've looked at and studied that seems to have such a close alignment between values and actions and creating a natural and a very sustainable business that so seems so simple and clear minded? No, I, I don't think we have it. the The true entrepreneurial genius, I think, from Yvonne is taking this deep love and desire to do good for the environment and not just doing things to, to make the environment better, you know, like saving the, the rivers and uh, setting aside parklands and, and, and donating, I think it's 1% or over yeah, 1%, 1% of all of their mm-hmm. sales, not profit, mm-hmm. but sales, total gross sales to a couple hundred or a couple thousand organizations on top of all of those things, he's actually designing the business model of Patagonia to be sustainable. So here's actually Yvonne kind of explaining his thinking on, well, you know, doing activities and things for the environment isn't enough. We need to actually make the business itself and the business model sustainable into the future. You know, American style of business is you're supposed to grow this business as fast as you possibly can. You don't have to make a profit, you just show lots of growth so that you can have an IPO, sell a bunch of stock to some suckers, and then, you know, you, you uh, retire to seize your world and play golf the rest of your life. Well, um, I don't believe that is, is right. And I've always felt that if uh, the, the farmer has this responsibility, well, so do I as a owner of a company. And so we decided to put our company in a path to where we would be here 100 years from now. So all the decisions made are for the long term, which means, you know, we can't grow 15% a year. We decided to grow at a natural growth. And so natural growth means when the customer tells you that uh, you're they're frustrated in, in buying your stuff. Your catalog, they just got the catalog and you're already sold out. That you just you need to make more. But we don't advertise on inner city buses to try to get gang kids to, write, to buy our, our black down jackets instead of Timberland or North Face. Um, the reason we got in the trouble in the first place is that with this cinchilla, we were selling stuff to people who wanted it but didn't need it. Whenever you're in that situation, you're a victim of the economy. The economy is going to go up and down, and you're going to go up and down like a yo-yo. And particularly if you really follow the fashion trends, and then you're really um, in a scary situation. I love that because what he what he pinpointed there is this sort of – dangerous, uh, almost, it feels like a Ponzi scheme, uh, sort of danger. If you're chasing growth, selling to people who want, but don't need your product means that as soon as tough times come, those people disappear. And that's what happened. He tells the story of they're expecting 50% growth. They only got 30 because the economy changed and they got into all sorts of trouble. I love this sustainable, natural idea of only selling to those who truly need and want your product. And what this does is it means you don't have to blast them with, you know, bus ads, billboards. You don't have to interrupt them and try and convince them because they're already convinced that they want your product. And it just feels like such a natural way of doing business. Patrick, have you ever heard of other brands that are just this natural about only wanting to sell to people that need their product? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that what he's talking about is against this whole obsession to scale, which Silicon Valley mm-hmm. has sort of embedded into mm-hmm. uh, 
business as usual, uh, unfortunately. But uh, yes, the first one that leaps to mind is Ford. Ford was originally made, uh, Henry Ford wanted, was a farmer, he was a farm boy. He wanted to make automobiles. Automobiles were already being made when he uh, started out, uh, but they were being made for wealthy people. The $150,000 Tesla leaps to mind. And and that's, they were making Duesenbergs and Pierce Arrows and so forth for millionaires. Henry Ford wanted to make a car for ordinary people so that ordinary people like him could buy one, have one. And so he started his company. Uh, ironically, he was working at, he knew that he wanted to make a combustible engine. Uh, he needed a spark plug. He went to work where for Henry, for, for Thomas Edison at G, the local GE plant, General Electric plant in uh, Detroit. Uh, Henry Ford was quickly made a supervisor. And the, <laughs> the funny thing is that Henry would punch in at Thomas Edison's company and he would go back home and work on his automobile. And uh, one day he got in an argument with his bankers one night and he wanted to sell uh, automobiles to the wealthy. And he expletive deleted. He walked out and they renamed that company Cadillac. The bankers did. And Henry went, Henry went on to make his, uh, his Ford, Ford Motor Company. Mm. So that's one. I think another one that might be Levi's because Levi's oh, was yeah. made, you know, the advertisements were uh, two horses or mules uh, trying to pull the jeans apart. And it was all about quality and it was all about not about style. Style was a function of, uh, I mean, the design was a function of utility. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, um, to me, it's very exciting to imagine building a company, building products that are so quality driven that solves such a big problem that marketing, uh, moves from being this sort of, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the consumer of trying to convince them. You would almost argue a lot of advertising and marketing is almost trying to trick the um, the consumer to consume this product. What a pleasant way to imagine being a, a chief marketing officer when all you're about is presenting this quality product to the people who know and love you and to tell them about what problem you can solve next for them. That seems like a like a marketing paradise. I wonder how, for how many companies this really exists today. Yeah, not not many. I, this this last clip I think was my favorite out of all of them precisely because that that is what I want our kind of capitalist society to to be is is more focused on the the needs as mm. opposed to the wants. I think this constant gener demand generation you know, by advertising and marketing, I think just fundamentally is unsustainable in, in the long run. I mean, sure, it looks great on the, on the earnings reports, but startups and companies that have to spend $9.75 to get a customer that pays them $10, I just think that's fundamentally unsustainable. And a company like Patagonia that's so focused on just building products that people need, it's really, it's really refreshing. And, you know, I want to see more companies held mm. to that high standard. Well, look at Twitter mm. right now. They're right in that hole. Tell us more about that. The whole obsession to scale. They're, I mean, they're not growing as quickly as they once were, and they're in a bit of trouble perceptually right now, aren't they? Mm. And trying mm. to pivot their way out of it. I mean, we'll see. I mean, I don't know when this, when people will be listening to this podcast, but uh, as of right now, they're in trouble. Let's see how they get out. Yeah, no, that's so true. So what we can see here from this whole purpose of building great products and not doing harm means that they, in the end, deliver products that have so much positive effect that it, it just breeds this natural group of people that want the product and need it at the same time. And Patagonia has no need for growth hacking, scale hacking. They can just continue on this beautiful wave of momentum and flow that is created by this high sense of purpose and keeping themselves accountable for it. Yeah, it's so, it, I was just going to say it's so counterintuitive right now because everyone's obsessing about the customer and what does the user say, user studies and so forth, uh, but not uh, so much here we're obsessing about Patagonia is obsessing about the quality. They're obsessing about the product itself. If they can make the product, that's great. Our customers will find us. They'll find them yes. to our door. And, and you can take a company that you can take companies like um, 
Apple and, and, and Amazon who might not come with this doing well by doing good purpose, but the shared attribute of success is solving problems for customers and obsessing about it. And this unlocks this momentum, this flywheel. And in the case of Patagonia, their flywheel is that they now have their own venture fund called Tin Shed Ventures. They have their own food company. They are on this massive uh, mission. But none of this mission is accomplished if you don't have good people that act in the right way. And for the last part of the show, we've got a couple of great clips that really go uh, directly, like laser focused into what they're doing with people and culture and how they make the uh, the underlying environment for uh, great people to do their best work within the organization. Now, we've talked a little bit about the book. We've talked a little bit about how the company came uh, to be. The, the, the way they hire people and the empowerment that they give them is at the heart of their successes, this autonomous, highly skilled, highly committed people. So let's now have a listen to let's get inside of this story and find out how they do it, how they create this great culture, how they hire people and how they, in the end, let them go surfing. You know, we wanted to be able to take off a month or two and go on an expedition and do that, you know, two, three times a year or more. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the name of the book, you know. That's, that's where I got the name for the book because we've had a company policy that you know, one of the lessons of surfing or powder skiing or any of those kind of sports is that you don't get, you don't go surfing next Tuesday at two o'clock because you may show up there and it's flat or blown out and you're a loser. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have a company policy that when the surf comes up, everybody drops their work that, that is a serious surfer and they go surfing. <laughs> You just got to be careful you don't have 100% of your employees surfers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so <clears throat> that means you got to hire very responsible people and then let them get their work done whenever they feel like, you know. <laughs> as long as it doesn't impact other people and, and the work gets done. I don't care when they work. How many... CEOs and founders and managers, have you ever come across that had that same attitude? I can't think of any. Yeah, I mean, it, it, just, it just seems to fly in the face of conventional wisdom, doesn't it? It, it? it just, where people are, I think, you know, providing a lot of value-add services in the office place to try and keep them there more. Yvonne Chouinard from Patagonia is like, guys, get out of here, go have some fun. Go uh, fulfill your dreams because I know you'll be a happier, healthier, more productive person for me. Like it's, I, I, and it, he seems almost so natural with this. And obviously, it comes from his own renegade characteristics. He doesn't even seem to realize how contrarian he is. I mean, Patrick, can you think of other contrarian leaders that have achieved this success? Well, sure. You mentioned one earlier, Richard Branson. Right, of mm. course. Steve Jobs, okay, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mentioned Ron Rice of Hawaiian Tropic, of course. Uh, Oprah Winfrey, I think, in her own way, of course. And I think it's, but here it's all about hire people you want to hang out with, right? Yeah. You know, in all yeah. of their things that he was talking about, they they do run off and have their sessions, intense ones. It sounds like about who they who they are, why do they want to, why they come to work in the morning why they do what they do and, but still have a fun culture, uh, still be the purpose driven, the ecology, the, all of these things are just sensible things that if you are hiking, surfing, you are pretty close to nature and you're in it and you can see if you're damaging this, the wall uh, or the crevasse that you're going up and pounding uh, spikes into pythons into and everything. And you can see when you're walking down uh, running down a path or surfing, you know, <laughs> bottles, plastic bottles and out the, floating out in the water, out in the surf and so forth. And I think once you mm. are that still that close to nature, some of this stuff makes uh, so much more sense than if you're sitting in a cube somewhere. 
Yeah, I think I think there is this such beautiful alignment between their values and the products that they make. It becomes so easy to manage people accordingly. But I, I think the one thing we have to realize, there is a secret sauce in how they do all of this. And um, you cannot possibly just walk into any workforce and say, hey, guys, go surfing. Um, this next yeah. clip is is where Yvonne really kind of puts a – puts a point to the characteristics that underlie this this whole philosophy and how they can build great products, do very little harm, and how they can let people go surfing. So let's have a listen to Yvonne Chouinard talking about autonomy. You know, we none of us um, liked authority. We really disliked authority, and none of us wanted to tell other people what to do. So our management system is kind of like an ant colony. Um, you know, an ant colony doesn't have any bosses. The queen just lays there and lays eggs. Um, there's no bosses in ant colony, but every single ant knows what its job is and gets it done. And they communicate by touching feelers, and that's about it. And it's kind of like a SEAL team. If one guy in the SEAL team says, oh, I don't know about this thing we're going on, I think I'm going to just hold back a little bit. It doesn't work. Every single person in that SEAL team has to agree this is what he's going to do. And if the leader gets killed, the next guy takes over. If he gets killed, the next guy takes over. It's, it's leaderless, really. And that's our management style. So I hire uh, very independent, very self-motivated people who believe in what we're trying to do, and I leave them alone. And in fact, I had a psychologist came one time and studied our company and said, gee, I got to tell you, um, we did psychological profiles on a lot of people, you know, to see if, make sure the right brain people were working on right brain jobs and stuff like that. But I said, I got to tell you, your people are so, the most independent people I've ever seen in a company. In fact, they're really unemployable anywhere else. <laughs> 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 it's a good thing, good thing you gave him jobs. <laughs> I love the fact that they're so autonomous you can't yeah. even, they couldn't work anywhere else. Yeah, I, I kind of like to joke that, you know, 10 years into my entrepreneurial journey, I'm fundamentally mm-hmm. unemployable. Not because I don't have any skills, but I think it's because I have such a high yeah. drive for autonomy. Which is why a company like Patagonia is so fascinating. And, you know, maybe, maybe I would consider working for a company like them. But the thing that's missing from this clip for me is like, how do you identify those people? And how can you be sure that you're working with someone that has the intelligence to work autonomously yeah. and, and get, you know, and take care of their area of responsibility? I mean, I can only imagine how arduous and personal and interpersonal the the hiring processes well, at Patagonia. Because the trouble with autonomy is you ask anybody, hey, you want to be a more, do you want to have an autonomous job? I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. And then it's like, you know, be careful what you ask for there. Um, I, I would want to ask you and Pat, Patrick, like you are both very autonomous productive individuals, writing books, making films, sometimes with big teams, sometimes you're leading the charge by yourself. How, what, what is it the essence of that characteristic for you, Patrick? What, 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 where does this autonomy start? Like what's the filter? How do you find it? Yeah, I I would say that it has to be self-motivated. You have to be self-motivated and want to get something done and do Mm -hmm. something. And yeah, I'm completely unemployable. And so it's the, I can give you a list of people to contact to verify that. But uh, (laughs) just to to support what um, we've been saying, Chris McDivitt Tompkins was Roger McDivitt's younger sister. And when she was in high school, she had a quote unquote rebellious streak. But when she was graduating, uh, Chris's counselor told her mother, "I, I know you're planning on sending Christine to college. Don't bother. And she, Christine later became a uh, general manager and CEO of Patagonia for 13 years. And um, so those are the people from out of the beach culture 
the surf culture, mountain culture and so forth, all independent people. And I guess the question, I mean, it'd be fascinating to find out how uh, you motivate someone like that. Um, I think that's a, Mm. I did not find that in the book, but Mm. uh, I'm sure they have lessons or uh, there are things to be learned, lessons for all of us there. Mm. It's, It's quite remarkable to imagine how a system can deliver so many great products over so many decades with all of these highly autonomous people that are given the choice to go surfing when they wish. I, I actually think um, it's it, the proof is there. I think that Yvonne Chouinard has actually demonstrated that if he's been in business since 68, if he's written the book, he's got a venture company, a fashion and garment company, he's got a food company. I think we can safely assume that this does work if you hire autonomous, self-directed people who are on a mission, who, who all share this greater mission of building great products and doing as little harm as possible. I think what sums up Yvonne so brilliantly is this humility and simplicity by which he goes about it and the scale of the success that we've all been talking about is something that we're so aware of that's why we chose him to do this show that's why he's up there with the nikes and the apples for us here at the moonshots podcast but the craziest thing is how how humble he is that in this not last and, and, and this next clip which is our last clip of the show It's only just dawning upon him the scale of the impact of his life's effort of the brand of Patagonia. It's only dawning upon him the impact that he's had on the world. So without further ado, let's have a listen to our last clip of the founder of Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard. You know, we're a relatively small company, but we have incredible amount of social power around the world. And it's, it's only dawned on me recently that, um, that we have this and there, therefore we probably have the responsibility to use that power and not just uh, hire other people to do the right thing and stuff. So it's changed the way our company operates instead of just giving money away to a bunch of NGOs, which we still do, but uh, we're doing a lot more stuff ourselves. We're influencing. We're being asked to go to Washington almost every week now to um, give advice on dam removal. And uh, I mean, that's pretty amazing. And yeah, I'm pretty stoked about, you know, the climbs I did on El Cap, you know, I've they were really important for me at that time. It, it built the character that I am now, probably. But uh, I'm, I'm starting to be pretty proud of the company, too. How, how humble is he, man? <laughs> I would <Jeez>. hope he's. <laughs> I love how he still says he, he was stoked about his, his El Cap oh, yeah. climbs. I mean, it, it's like you can take him off the off the the rock face, but you can't take yeah. the dirt yeah. bag yeah. out of him. It's, yeah. it's really great. Well, there are a couple of things out of that. I think that, you know, there's an intensity and intelligence and integrity there, but it's kind of like leave the fun in fun in and, uh, you know, don't be a grease ball. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he really has that, that clear thing of here's what I want to be. Here's what I don't want to be. And, um, by, by, creating great products by serving customers, by really solving the problem with a product you can rely on and hopefully for life. Uh, You can have this very natural, sustainable business where people are empowered. Uh, Not only are your customers empowered by your products, but the people who work for you are empowered. And um, no wonder everybody wants to get a piece of Yvonne Chouinard and Patagonia that that they summons him to to Washington, D.C. and beyond. I, I think that, you know, in, in listening to him, what we're hearing is somebody who is so down to earth, but don't let that fool you, deeply, deeply motivated. He's, he's a renegade. He's on a mission. And even after all the success of Patagonia, he has, 
He said, no, it's not just good enough to leave the world as you found it. He's like, no, my legacy and everyone's legacy should be to leave it in a better place than we found it. So he's already lifting his game again, which Chad, I mean, I think this is pretty inspiring for this guy who's out there surfing and he's plus 70 years of age and he's still climbing, metaphorically speaking, big mountains. Yeah, I the 10X that I've uncovered in these clips is really around creating something that people need as opposed to focusing on what they think people want. Mm. I know, Patrick, you're kind of talking about this, how companies are now obsessed with user studies and focus groups and, and asking people what people, you know, what they want. I, this idea of like buying a product and never having to buy another one ever again, because it'll be recycled and replaced and repaired, f- you know, yeah. for life is, I don't, I don't see how you can get any better than that. I mean, unless they figure out this nanobot technology that like replicates <laughs> the things after you buy them, like that's the only place I can see, I can see them going after this. And I think they do stand alone in in the clothing and, and fashion and retail category because of that product obsession and removing all you know barriers in the customer's mind of of why why they need it. Yeah. I think that, you know, in the end, he's he's still the village blacksmith, you know, building better things. Yeah. Simple, well made, last a long time. Yeah. So simple, so true but it takes so much hard work to do. But I can tell you guys that this podcast has not been hard to produce uh, with you, Chad, and our special guest, Patrick Hanlon. I walk out of this and I'm thinking if I ever create another company, if I look at the companies that I'm involved with now, the bar has just been raised uh, significantly after being inspired by Yvonne Chenard. For you, Patrick, what's the big takeaway what what changes after studying Yvonne Chenard for you? Don't be a greaseball. <laughs> so true. So true. Don't be a greaseball. And Chad, what are, what are you walking away with? Uh, I, again, going back to kind of their obsession with their product, like don't assume that something that you didn't think could be done before can't mm. be done. So polyester clothing's never been recycled. So therefore we can't do it. Well, actually, maybe not. Let me, you know, let's look into it. Let's, let's scour the globe and find the best artisans Mm. or, you know, maybe maybe we can't make this corduroy anymore. Well, actually I've heard of this, this, you know, factory in Scotland that maybe they can do it. I think because, because Yvonne came from this lifestyle where he was living in a, out of a van, you know, with the Mm. clothes on his back and he just, just climbing mountains and he had to be an extremely resourceful person. You know, he bought his own forge and anvil and taught himself how to make his pythons or his, so his pythons. So and resourceful. Yeah. He just, he, you know, actually, this is interesting. He kind of, in a way, goes back to first principles and thinking in a way that Elon Musk does, but from kind of a, a, a ground mm. up point of view instead of kind of this pointed out yeah. into the sky like, yeah. like Elon. He just, he doesn't take anything for granted and doesn't really hold any assumptions. So I guess that's all to say, like, I'm going to question some things a little bit more and, uh, you know, not take, take so many things for granted, uh, and think that, well, they have to stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. I want to add, actually, I want to add something, you know, I've always felt like a juvenile delinquent and, um, Mm -hmm. so this sucks. I'm going to do my own thing has always been sort of in my brain anyway, but I really like this notion of, the falconry term, the Yarrick thing mm. we mentioned earlier about um, being in a constant state of super alertness and hungry, ready to hunt. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, so, so fortunate to share with both yourselves and the listeners, guys. I want to thank you, Patrick Hanlon, Thanks for having author me. of Primal Branding. You have given us some primal thinking you have inspired us uh helped us decode what i think chad has been one of the greatest entrepreneurs one of the most exciting entrepreneurs we've done on the show today correct yeah but before we let you go patrick i just wanted you to have a chance you know to give a short little plug for yourself where can we find you online uh etc oh sure uh you can find me on amazon 
dot com. Uh, Primal Branding is the first book. It is, uh, I should probably mention, put in a plug. Uh, it's required reading at YouTube. And the second book, The Social Code, is now an audible book. And um, it's only 40 minutes long. So a little bit shorter than this podcast. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm working on a third. Whoa. So watch for that. There is another book on the way. That'll be done in uh, out in two or three months. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Chad. Um, well, thanks for having me. You're so welcome. And uh, for all of the listeners, you can get all the show notes. You can give us feedback. You can find out our next shows. You can find out all of this information at moonshots.io. And, and Chad, I think we've got to the point where we're uh, we're ready to to bid farewell. What's what's rest? What's the rest of the evening in uh, Brooklyn have in store for you? Oh, you know, just uh, heading back from Dumbo to Clinton Hill, uh, my neighborhood. Uh, I I get to to walk to work. It's uh, it's I guess my form of surfing. You know, my my moving walking mm. meditation. Yeah, and just, you know, looking forward to enjoying the spring weather that has finally arrived here. And Patrick, what's what's next in Minneapolis? Is is, is there a, a warmth emanating? Is it is it warm enough to ride around that, that lake on the bike that we know you love to do? Yes and no. Ironically, we mm-hmm. sat out on the uh, deck uh, over the weekend and we put the table out for the first time. And I said, isn't it a little odd to be sitting between two snowdrifts? <laughs> Well, it's the optimism. My wife, my wife said no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. we admire the optimism, and and I'm sure Yvonne Chenard would as well. I'm I'm gonna launch into my day here in Sydney, Australia. I want to thank you both again. I want to thank all of our listeners. I want to remind them everything you need about the show is at Moonshots. Don't I O, and I want to thank everybody for being part of the journey into Patagonia, and one of the most inspiring entrepreneurs to date on the show, Yvonne Chenard. So thank you to all of you, thank you to our listeners, and we'll catch you next time on the Moonshots Podcast. That's a wrap. <laughs>